Welcome to the stage, Jason and Colin from Cargill. Oh, this is happening. There they go. Oh, here we go. Don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, they left the living room out and everything. You're on the other side. You're on that side. What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, and it's allowed. All right. So, hey, everyone, thanks for, uh, thanks for attending. Um, just said, we've got a, a, a few slides here that we're going to go through and talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we're doing at Cargill, um, as well as just in general over the course of uh, some life, uh, life experience and, and working in, in IT, um, and go through and talk about the uh, building up an engineering culture. Uh, we each have a clicker, so it's going to be interesting as we go through to be like, hey, now it's time for next, and then we double click. No, OK. Yeah, we haven't navigated who's clicking. You clicked. All right. Um, I am Colin Schaub. I am a, I think my title is lead API engineer at Cargill, which is just a rather goofball title to, to get me into the organization. Um, co with Jason, Jason and I co-own a platform at Cargill, which we call CAPI, the Cargill API platform. And we're part of a larger initiative at Cargill called Digital Labs, where we are trying to foster uh, new, innovative, cutting-edge engineering practices at a large agribusiness. Uh, one of the things that, you know, as we go through this, there's going to be um, some of the, the main topics that we want to talk about, and we're going to talk about particular attributes or a couple of the, like a subset of the particular ideas. Um, but we'd love to be able to continue the conversation, whether it's here at the conference or Kong Nation, um, up in GitHub, whatever the case may be. But I uh, kind of want to put a call out because we definitely find value in making use of the different Kong Nation um, places to be able to go and, and chat with um, even outside of the summit. And during our conversion to PowerPoint, we lost some of the formatting and just yeah, realized that. There? All right, awesome. So, a little uh, bit of impromptu. I'm going to read this to you about Cargill. Oh, it's black wow. text. You can yeah, see it's it on black text. This is, this is awesome. So, a uh, <laughs> little bit about Cargill. Um, we've been around for over 150 years. I think we're about at 155 years. Um, we know that we're not going to be able to achieve our purpose and our mission around um, helping the world thrive and, and nourishing the world without the use of technology. Um, we have a lot of traditional foundations in place. We have a couple thousand plant type facilities. And so we are steeped in legacy when it comes down to being able to, to manage plants in the operation of agriculture as it turns into doing things like um, harvesting seed, uh, milling the seed, and then being able to distrib distribute the seed. Uh, so one of the things uh, around building this engineering culture um, you know, we, we had some conversations early on with some folks at Kong about content that we wanted to be able to, uh, to, to present and, and to, to talk about. And one of the things that, uh, that Mike, um, the, one of the people that we, we work with at Kong, um, said, hey, you know what would be great is talk a little bit about behind the scenes, the things that you're doing inside of your particular area um, within our, enterprise, our corporate IT function um, about the way that we actually connect with and work with different teams on how we will, will hope that we're able to, to get them to level up. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to be able to, to, to land on is um, if, we, if we get ourselves to a point where we can start to incorporate things like experiential learning, um, collaboration and empathy in the way that we work with each other, then it becomes much easier for us to identify the important things that, that we are looking to create. And that kind of anchors back to some of the earlier keynote content about empowering those connections and specifically the connections that matter. Uh, I always have to look at the name of, of the, the person that uh, this quote is from, uh, but Makokoma Mokohana. Um, this is just a quote that, uh, you know, when going through and kind of th thinking about the theme, um, the weaker the desire to change, the further away from now is the moment from which we plan on changing. And one of the things at a company like Cargill or in, in places where they're, you're just steeped in, the, in legacy is that the desire to change is sometimes not as strong as what you feel is, is uh, that uh, the insurmountable obje uh, obstacles or object objects that are in the, in the path. Um, and so one of the things that we look at when we go to, to start small, iterate often, learn from our mistakes, is it's a bit like building with Legos um, and, and identify what those building blocks are to be able to create and to show those, those small successes. Uh, so we intend to hit on basically these four topics overall throughout the next half an hour-ish. Um, talk 
talk a bit about attributes of the engineering culture that we're trying to foster at Cargill. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about incorporating the lean concepts and principles, how we're bringing that into the organization, um, the primitives and the building blocks that we're using to foster the engineering, engineering culture, and then wrapping it up with uh, some of the self-service and usage patterns that we've built up for our DevOps teams to consume. You ready? So, yeah, I don't want to double click. There we go. There we go. All right, so we, there are six attributes of an engineering culture at, uh, at Cargill that we talk about. We're really only going to get into, um, I think, the first three here, leadership, workspace, processing culture. Um, now, the, the, the picture here is, is really about identifying and realizing and recognizing that before we know everything as far as the, the way that like, our leadership is going to manage and maintain a, a set of objectives that the, the corporation or that the business is going to go towards, there's a bit of understanding that as long as we understand in general the direction that we're after and going, um, it's okay to be able to continue to iterate and move forward. So getting into leadership, um, we, we, we outline the leadership aspect in, in three different areas, uh, focus, pace, and message. Uh, with focus, it really comes down to, and, and we, what we would like to be able to, to make sure that our leaders are aware of is um, landing on what the, what the idea of a North Star is. So if you, if you think of at a, at a large scale corporation, um, Cargill has about 150,000, 160,000 employees. Uh, we, we do business in 70 different countries. Um, we're across, um, we might be, have something in every continent. Um, the focus and what leadership is able to bring is to be able to, to reduce the noise in the signal around what are the really big, important um, things that the, that the company needs to do. And that filters down into the technologists. Um, that then turns into a conversation around pace. And we like to, to put pace in the context of what are the type of investments that we're willing to put forth so that all the different areas, whether you are in maybe that mode one, mode two um, type of conversation, or if you're working in uh, plant operations, what is the type of investment that leadership is willing to make to move something into a, a modern state? Uh, in some cases, that might mean bringing more people along or being, uh, uh, adding more people into an environment. It might mean actually more fiscal type of contribution to be able to, to invest in, in physical type things. For us, it might be in a plant. Uh, if you think of things like IoT. Um, and then for message and tone, um, this is really making sure that it's clear that when we talk about um, putting the right, op putting the right um, pieces in place, the right investments in place, that the right level of, um, of uh, flexibility is built into um, the culture. And what this allows us to do as technologists is to be able to have some uh, um, that flexibility around um, understanding that even with ambiguity, we're able to execute against a specific set of, of, of objectives because we understand what the big, moving, the, the big things are that we're, we're after. Oh, there we go. Uh, workspace. Um, this actually kind of flows into some of the developer slash engineering um, experience. Um, one of the things that we, we the, the three areas in workspace talk about collaboration, um, and the idea of any time and then anywhere. And with collaboration, uh, this flows definitely into collab uh, not only collaboration, but experiential learning to understand that within the ecosystem, not only is it things like um, your workspace and the, the, the physical tools that you might have at hand, like the difference between a Windows workstation and a Mac, but also understanding that as a whole, there's, a, there's an opportunity for there to be optimizations across the board for everyone to essentially have a, a winning outcome. Um, anytime, um, this kind of flows right into inspiration. At any given time, somebody might have an idea that is just going to, to potentially be um, an a, a amazing example of being able to execute. Um, at the same time, it could be a great way to be able to identify a way to not do something. Um, I don't know if uh, folks are familiar with some of the uh, examples from like Spotify and their engineering. Uh, they have an engineering blog. Um, and when they talk about their engineering culture, one of the things that they talk about is somebody during a hackathon made use of a rotary dial phone in order to spin up, a, like to be able to queue up a song. Now, the idea was sort of silly, but at the same time, they wanted to show that even if in an analog world of like rotary dial phones, being able to connect something. So based upon just that, that idea of at any given time, we could try an idea out and see what kind of le le lessons we can learn becomes really important. Um, anywhere, one of the key things that we, we go after at Cargill and, and as we're looking to improve the overall experience for developers, engineers, our data scientists, 
um, is the idea that identity is more important than device. Um, and a lot of the times, a lot of our process and workspace is derived around you are physically located inside of a particular location, thereby you get access to certain internal services. Well, what if we pivoted that and said, you know, like, let's continue to shrink our network and make it to where it's zero trust and make it to where the fact that you're logged in at a conference, you, for example, sir, that you're on a Mac and you're logged in, your identity gets you access into the things you need at that particular time so you could collaborate with the right people at the right time. And then the last leadership piece, process and operations. Kind of think of this as internal IT for IT. Um, Kaizen, it's, uh, you know, it's the idea of continuous improvement, having the appropriate metrics in place so that internally you understand where you can make improvements um, to make it to where you're able to not only make IT better for IT, but also then make IT better for the business. In services, um, really like the idea of the 80-20 rule here, so we kind of threw that out there as the cup. If 80% of the requests that are coming through are able to get through a self-service, automated, really safe and secure way to be able to consume a set of services, uh, make sure that those are readily available, easy to use, um, and reduce the overall friction for, for the community. Um, and then OKR is making sure when we do apply metrics or we are consuming information, that the, the details about the important things to, to work on and the low-hanging fruit are based upon actual data-driven decisions. Um, that just kind of pulls back in some of the, idea, the ideas around leadership. Um, uh, making sure that when we understand what the right things are and what the right pace is, that we actually apply metrics and data to be able to prove or disprove that we're, we're applying uh, things in the right way. All right, the concepts, and we're gonna go through this. Ready, all right. Uh, so becoming a learning organization. Um, we, we got a couple of quotes here, but one for, uh, from Fred Rogers. Uh, the most important learning is the ability to accept and expect mistakes and deal with the disappointments that they bring. Um, this, when it comes to, when we look at the way that we want to build up an engineering culture, we have to make sure that everyone is aware that this is a safe place. And if people are not in a position or they don't feel like they can share the things that they learned, they're not going to, to go down a path of making themselves vulnerable. And that's just sort of human nature. So it's a bit of having to, to go against some of that. Ooh, wait, no way oh. back. Too fast. Burp. There you go. So this is a follow on to the previous slide. Um, one of our primary tenets in our engineering culture that we're trying to foster is that we're trying to allow teams to embrace failure. We're trying to allow them to try new things, um, try them out for a period of time, and actually maybe fail at them on occasion. And oddly enough, that's a difficult conversation to have with senior leadership, uh, no matter what organization you're in. It's been about, I'd say, two years since, give or take, since we started this initiative. And I would say it took a year for that lesson that one can fail to really sink in. Um, and I still kind of negotiate with, you know, kind of the higher ups, like, are we sure we're still on, still on the alignment here, that like projects can fail? Um, so it's been like an interesting uh, journey with a large organization that is used to bringing in outside consultancies that, that deliver projects on time, under budget, or on budget, and you know, with certain functionalities. And what we're trying to foster is more of a creative environment where people can try new things and excel and or just bomb out. Um, in that regard, uh, we have tried different things um, as CAPI, as our API platform. Um, as simple example is uh, we deploy everything to Kubernetes cluster, so all of our new de IT deployments, all of our new projects go through uh, a CICD, platform, CICD pipeline that eventually deploys them to an EKS uh, Kubernetes cluster. And our original idea that we thought would be really cool would be to like, get people going, we would create our own namespace in the cluster, and we would be the owners of this namespace and be the single points of contact and uh, would help people maybe onboard to the Kubernetes environment a little faster. Turns out that's a horrible idea when you have 450 APIs and maybe one of those APIs has like a security incident or something like that. And then Jason and I become the single point of contact for all those APIs in our namespace that we have to contact and reach out to and touch base with and make sure everything's okay. And, and developers in 20, in 20 countries. Yeah, in 20 countries, different languages, different time zones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's another, another good example. The other thing we did is about a year ago, 
Um, and this was before the database list Kong config came out. We decided it would be a phenomenal idea to like define a YAML document that would be like, here, I want to deploy an API. And if you just have the minimums, like your upstream and your URI, you can pretty much deploy it. And so we spent some time, and we came up with this lengthy YAML definition that ended up looking a lot like Kong's database list uh, API definition. And that was also a horrible idea. Um, what we ended up doing is we scrapped all that and decided to uh, essentially take a couple steps backwards and simplify things immensely and just say, from now on, we're just going to deploy as is JSON. We're going to take it from GitHub, and we're going to deploy it into uh, Kong as is. Like We might do some variable replacement and stuff like that, but we're not going to try and abstract it because we're not going to try and understand all of the various customer requests and use cases that could possibly come along. We're just going to say, as is, goes into Kong. And that was a huge simplification that we made uh, that allowed us to be a little bit more flexible and not try and engineer for, engineer for, the, for the world. Um, to that end, when we were developing this slide, uh, Simplify inputs to increase successful velocity of outputs. I'm like, what the heck does that mean? I thought about it for a little bit, and it essentially comes down to less is more. Um, and so that was the decision that we made about a year ago. Goes back to we're not going to try and engineer our own Kong you know, policy YAML definition. We're not going to try and uh, invent the whole deployment of an API policy definition into Kong. We're going to spend some time, understand the customers a lot better, and build out some small tools to help us manage the platform, um, and then spend that time and understand the, the customers better. So one of the things we did, and I think the Australia National Bank did something very similar, we created a CLI tool that uh, allows us to manage all of our Kong gateways in whichever environment, uh, push policies into the Kong gateway, uh, check on, you know, read the stats out of each Kong instance, um, all from a CLI, and that allows essentially me to manage 450 APIs across all of our environments. Um, and we don't need a huge team of people, and we don't need to spend a lot of time and engineer a big pipeline to do it. We can manage it via one CLI, push the, push the JSON files into Kong, and kind of we're done. Um, during that time, while we were using the CLI, like I said, we spent a lot of time and understood what the customers are asking, what they're not asking for, so that, again, we don't need to engineer, uh, don't need to spend so much time engineering capabilities that are not needed by the customers. Um, another thing that we did that really allowed us to simplify the deployment of policies to Kong was, and I think you guys did something very similar, uh, we created a little policy validator. Um, so right before the CLI uh, pushes a, Kong or a policy into Kong, runs it through a little rules engine. Does it have rate limiting? Um, is there a bot detection policy attached to it? Uh, basic things like that, some sane defaults, checks and balances. And then essentially, once that policy validator passes uh, the policy, I can just run my CLI, and it just goes right in. And I don't, don't need to worry about it. Um, and it was those two simple tools that I think allowed us to, as one and a half, two, two people here, uh, deploy and manage 450 policies to four different environments and all of our instances of Kong. Uh, next. Yeah, so, the, um, so on deferring commitment from some of the lean principles, um, this is Mary Pymendijk. Um We shouldn't add features until they are needed. Forget just in case, develop just in time. Um, as Colin was talking about, as far as the different types of things that we were working on, we got really caught up a couple of times in trying to identify and build out features that we were pretty sure customers didn't know they needed until they were going to ask for it, and eventually they were going to ask for it because through experience, like eventually people are going to ask for certain things. And, and an example of that would be um, building out a, a um, a cache content environment behind our gateways so that we can stop hitting backends for commonly requested pieces. Um, we worked on a set of patterns and, and got things squared away, but at the same time, the, our customers 
weren't even realizing the number of times that we were making requests to the back end because in, a, in the scope of like back to basics, they weren't doing anything around metrics for their own APIs. So it was a bit of before we get to the point of adding all these features that nobody's ready to actually consume yet, how do we get it to where we're actually focused in on what's actually being requested and delivering those types of features in a, on a timely basis? Switch. So the theme is we deferred a little bit of that commitment. Um, like I said, we took the step back. We said we're not going to try and automate like a super fancy uh, policy deployment pipeline. Um, we spent that time and we understood what customers were asking and what they weren't asking. And it turns out what they're asking for was, was not, very, not very much. The basic problems they were looking for is how do I define a unique URI so that I can deploy my API to Kong and have it coexist in a multi-tenanted API gateway. Um, and then it took about a year for them to start asking more complicated questions. And so now we're thinking about a year after we've started, we're ready to do kind of some more awesome things. Um, we're going to start to build out the automation process, event, uh, event the deployment of the policies out to Kong based off of like PRs and commits out of GitHub. Um, we are defining more of the standards, like URA, URI uh, naming standards. We're going to start implementing more self-service, the ability to query the gateway and say, is my URI unique? Can I deploy this API to the gateway, and will it, can it coexist with 450 other APIs? Um, I think Jason alluded to it. We've started to introduce the proxy cache, which uh, as the API teams started deploying their APIs, it took them about a year for them to say, hey, 99% of these requests to this one URI, like we don't need to go all the way to the back end. And so they reached out to me about two months ago and they said, can we do caching? And I said, yep, we can. And I'm glad we didn't like try and implement it a year ago because that would have just burned much, a bunch of time. And so then a month or a month or two ago, that's when we started building out uh, you know, the, the Redis cache infrastructure behind the proxy cache plugin. And so now we have teams slowly starting to consume the proxy cache like that. Um, we started to build a, a website. We call it CapyDocs. Um, so anytime an API development team needs information about best practices on how to build an API, naming conventions, uh, the name of the repository in GitHub, how to, like after I deploy my API, how do I find the logs? Um, basic how-tos on everything surrounding the API developer's life. We're putting in like, a website that you can go to, search through content, and figure out how to self-service their own API. Um, and then better customer delivery. We started using GitHub. Uh, we've alluded to that. GitHub for all of the customer interaction. And so we're using that as the primary mechanism for uh, tracking any changes to policies and the deployments of those policies to the Kong gateways. Um, and again, more learning. Like, I hope we have another screw-up story later. <laughs> well, one thing, and I, I mentioned that, uh, that Colin and I, we work in uh, our digital labs area. So digital labs sits inside of our, our global IT function, which is inside of, Car inside of Cargill. The uh, consumable docs piece, one of the things that not only was it a matter of having this website for people to go to, across our digital labs area, we're all using the same type of mechanism to publish those docs. So when it comes down to our developers that go from our cloud platform to an API platform to our data platform, et cetera, it's a common look and feel, and we've made it to where it's, a, we think, a better experience. Um, Mapping that back to some of the deferred commitment, there was a bit of one team doing one thing, another team like making use of Wiki, and another team just making use of GitHub readmes. Um, but making it to where we've landed on a similar approach, we've been able to now consolidate things into essentially one place for people to go to see the documentation across the board. Um, so that's been a, a really positive outcome. And identifying primitives. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we want to make sure that we're able to do um, is to get into, uh, at that platform level, um, helping builders build. Uh, so within Digital Labs, we've got uh, a couple of different areas that are in our foundation space, and they work on, as I, I talked about, uh, API platform, cloud platform, or data platform. These are the platforms that, different than projects or products, are there for uh, essentially creating an opinionated way to, to get stuff done. 
um, with the expectation that the things that are produced are reusable, repeatable patterns that coming back to the, the, uh, the IT operations of process, that whole 80-20 rule, if 80% of the time our customers in that platform space are able to use what we are providing to build customer-facing digital applications, we feel like that's a really good metric for us to be able to continue and make sure that we're doing the right things. Um, likewise, we talk about a platform. We feel like there's every day there's an opportunity with the engagement that we have. Um, that's kind of the purpose for like this this train platform. Is every day there's a there's a new set of opportunities for um, new customers, new people, uh, new experiences for us to be able to to land on, understand, and see what do we need to do to potentially pivot. Uh, much like the like the rails at a train station, we can have different types of of vehicles that are going down down this path, different types of trains. Um, but as long as we've got some of the core infrastructure pieces in place, we feel like we're going to be able to to stay pretty flexible in the way that we we approach the the, the future on on these different uh, platforms. And then Kaizen, um, big enough uh, proponent of Kaizen that I actually have the tattoo, um, and and it's it's with this that we have we have an understanding internally within our our space that you know, customers, even our internal facing customers, are the the ones that are going to be the the there to drive the right delivery of the right things that we're looking to build. Um, Kong being a component of that in a, in, a, in a broader ecosystem of how do we want to be able to express the way that we need these applications and products to be able to work together. Um, we really look forward to, you know, with the way that the, some of the things have been uh, announced in the earlier keynote, some of the new features and so forth, um, being able to, to bring those in of how do we actually enhance and amplify the messaging between the applications and make use of uh, some of these new tools and technologies. All right. So, let me go backwards here. So the next two things we want to touch on briefly is, and we've alluded to it, self-service orientation and opinionated and transparent. Um, essentially, by providing like what, we call, what we're calling CAPI as a API platform, um, we're providing a, I gotta think about this a little bit, um, a tool, like we're building a platform, and the platform is not an end in and of itself. The platform needs to allow other projects uh, to, to build things. Uh, we're trying to enable like a, a cons consistent user experience by using the same tools over and over again, and then using tools that are generally available and consumable by, that you see out, out in the wild, I guess. Um, this diagram I thought was interesting. This is a diagram that we have on our internal wiki, and it just kind of shows our overall CI CD process, and it's it's pretty it's pretty normal. Uh, it, most IT organizations have capabilities and tools that facilitate you know any of the boxes or bullet points in this diagram. But an interesting thing at a company with 160,000 people and 5,000 locations around the world is over time, you develop snowflakes. And so at Cargill, we probably have like every source control uh, repository you can think of from Perforce to Subversion to CVS uh, and what have you. And so the reusable tools that we're trying to uh, showcase and get people to use are, like, like I said, GitHub, we're trying to have an opinionated view on what these tools should be. And then, you know, similar in a similar fashion, like for data monitoring and alerting, uh, Cargill has, you know, a lot of them on-prem. So we decided to use, uh, just throw it out there, Datadog, and we're saying that all the logs will end up in Datadog, and we're not going to force or, like, Projects themselves shouldn't go out and find and implement their own capabilities for these boxes. We're going to provide implementations of everything in these boxes for all the dev teams, provide examples of how to use them, document how to use them. Like I said, on our CAPI docs, you can go in and figure out how to find my application's log in Datadog. Um, and then the, the hope is that we don't have as many snowflakes because in one of the earlier presentations, like the, uh, it was the, the Bring Your Own Technology acronym. And I thought, like, sure, at Cargill, we've got probably every technology under the planet. Uh, but one of the things that I think that Cargill was lacking by having every source control system under the planet was 
some sort of culture or historical reference behind the projects. If you've got one project in subversion and another project in subforce, and there's no, there's no community around this, the source code, you're, you're losing a lot of the historical narrative around the projects and the knowledge around these projects by having multiple source control systems and multiple chat ops mechanisms and multiple uh, de deployment pipelines. And so that's why like, we've made, we have strong opinions that we should use the following tools, and then we back those opinions up with best practices and standards and pipelines that drive those tools. And to me, the takeaway, and you know, for sure using like GitHub as the source code repository for all the new projects right now, is we have developers all around the world all collaborating and chatting and you know, commenting and PRing, and it's, it creates much more of a social setting and it more, of an, more of a collaborative environment for the, for the DevOps team, which I don't think Cargill had before we started using a tool like, like GitHub. Uh, so. There's, there's one important thing, I think, with, with this, and that is, well, the, the tools themselves are essentially commodities. We, we like the ability to be able to say we can swap these things out, but by making sure that we've got appropriate patterns and that the development community as, whole, as a whole is consuming those patterns, it becomes really clear where the gaps are so that we can prioritize where we would actually look to make changes to either underlying tooling or even update our patterns. Yeah, we've swapped out the uh, chat ops implementation three or four times. Three or four times. <laughs> Uh, we want to thank uh, Kong Summit for, for having us out here. I think we're pretty much coming up on time. I think, uh, again, they're like joining the conversation. Uh, we're big fans of, of getting out there and Kong Nation and so forth. Um, I don't know if we actually, like, this isn't quite the, the format for like any questions, but would love to know if, uh, if anyone has any questions. Um, otherwise, we thank you, and uh, we are all set.